everyone. In this lecture video, we continue stuff about limits again. And uh, I will give uh, in this video a new tool, which is called Sandwich Theorem to compute the limits and uh, another very useful tool to compute limits algebraically, you will see. So um, let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, the topic of this video is sandwich theorem and this fact, which will be useful in computing limits algebraically. Okay, what is sandwich theorem? You see the formal definition taken from your course book, but let me try to explain it for you. Okay, uh, you have an ordering between your functions given in the statement. We assume that g of x is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to h of x. This is our assumption. And if you know this inequality, if we assume that this is our assumption, okay, so let's write this separately. We have an assumption in the theorem. Theorems are consists of assumptions and conclusions, right? So what's our assumption? We assume that this ordering holds between these three functions. And if you know that limit of g of x is the same as Okay, let me write this another way. So there is another assumption here. If limit of g of x and h of x is the same, has the same value L. So how can I indicate this in my explanation? If x goes to the number C, if the limit of g of x, if the values of g of x is approaching L, and if the situation is the same for h of x, they have, they both have limits at L as x goes to c, then here comes the conclusion. The conclusion of Sandwich theorem tells you that the function between g of x and h of x, which is f of x, is squeezed by those functions as c goes to zero, so that it has to have the limit, have the limit as l. Okay, this is the conclusion of Sandwich theorem. So um, this is really explained best by this picture. So let's say this pink one is our function h, yellow one is the function g, and blue one is the function f. You see what happens around the point c. Around point c, the limit of h of x function and g of x function is the same on both sides of c, you see? That's why the function in between the blue function f is squeezed so that it has to have the limit L as X goes to C. That's why sometimes we call sandwich theorem as the squeeze theorem. Okay, this is the statement of it, uh, very natural to understand. And let's look at this first example about sandwich theorem. You see F of X function is given in between these two functions. Here, uh, this is in fact the g of x function given in the statement, and this is the h of x function. So we have this inequality. And let's look at the limits of g of x and h of x. Limit of g of x. So we want to search for the limit of f of x as x goes to zero. So x goes to zero. What is this limit? x goes to zero, two minus x cubed over five. So uh, you can evaluate limits by just evaluating the given expression at the given point, if there is no problem, this works. So if you insert x equals zero here, zero over five is zero, so the result is two. On the other hand, limit of the upper function h of x as x goes to zero is what? This is two plus x squared over three. By the way, these are both polynomials. And you compute the limit of polynomials by just inserting the corresponding limiting value. So just insert zero here and you got two again. You see the limit of upper function and the lower function are both the same, which is two. Then by sandwich theorem, 
what happens, what is the conclusion of the sandwich. If lower and upper function has the same limit, which is two in the particular example, then the middle function as x goes to zero has to be the same by you two, by sandwich theorem, of course, okay? I look at the next example and very similar. G of x function is uh, bounded below by this function and above by this function. And if you look at the limits of lower and upper bounding function as x goes to zero, what happens? Just this is a polynomial, just insert zero for x, result is two. This is what you, you can try to compute the limit by evaluation like this by putting x equals zero. We know the cosine value of the zero. What is it? It is one, so same, you find two, which shows that by sandwich theorem, limit of the middle function as x goes to zero has to be the same value two, okay? Okay, so maybe um, I can invent here another example that shows more strongly than this two one, why sandwich theorem is a very strong tool to compute limits. Okay, another example. Let's consider this one. A f of x is given as sine one over x. X is um, different than zero. If x is zero, it is given as zero. Okay, let's look at this function. We want to compute the limit of this function around uh, zero. Okay. So what happens to limit of this function? Normally, we mentioned sine one over x function before, okay? So it behaves like this. It oscillates between plus one and minus one and around origin, it oscillates too much that we mentioned this before, if you remember, around origin, it oscillates infinitely many times between minus one and one, okay? So, in fact, this function has no limit around zero. Limit of f of x as x goes to zero, uh, sine one over x, this does not exist impact, okay? Because of the reason that it oscillates too many times, infinitely many times between plus, and min plus one and minus one, there is no finite number to which your, the values of your function is approaching. That's why limit does not exist. But what if we consider this function now? X times sine one over X, if X is different than zero, if X is zero, it is zero, okay? Then what happens? So uh, this time, what is the difference between f and g? It is this x expression in front. This time, the graph is drawn like this. Let me show you. This is y equals x. This is y equals minus x. So if you insert an extra x multiple here, the graph is affected like this. So it does the same oscillation as before, but the values are squeezed between y equals x and y equals minus x line, okay? The values are squeezed between these two. That's why now we can we may have some hope to have a limit at the origin because you see it is squeezed between these two. So uh, this time, the values of your function are not oscillating between minus, and minus one and plus one and anymore. This g of x function is squeezed between these two lines. So instead of oscillating between minus one and plus one, it in fact gets closer and closer to the origin. From the graph, you see that the limit of g of x function as x goes to zero is what? It is squeezed between these two lines. So 
from left, from right, no matter which direction you choose, you see that the values are squeezed towards zero, so this limit is zero. But what, what if you don't know the graph? Then you can first way from the graph to compute the limit. Second way, if you don't know the graph of this function, don't worry, you can compute algebraically by using sandwich theorem. Okay, how do you do that? You will try to find an upper and lower bound for this function to be able to apply the sandwich theorem. So sine one over x is in fact an, a trigonometric function and it takes the values between minus one and one. You know, this is a, recall that this is an, this is a fact that sine theta is between minus one and one. It doesn't matter what kind of expression you have for the angle, minus one and one are the lower upper bounds for the sine uh, function. Okay, then let's, in the first case, assume that X is greater than zero. And if what if, if we multiply both sides by X then minus X, X times sine one over X, less than or equal to, you see, I keep the, um, direction of the inequalities, I didn't reverse them because X is a positive value. So now let's see what happens at upper and lower bounding functions as X goes to zero. They both goes to zero as X goes to zero in the limiting value. That's why by sandwich theorem, the limit of the middle function as X goes to zero is zero. And this is the result in which case for x is greater than zero. What happens if x is less than zero? Then you will multiply every side by x again, like this. But this, in this case, you have to reverse the inequalities because x is a negative value. So x times sine 1 over x. But if you take the limits again as x goes to zero, then you will see that upper lower bound functions are both going to zero again. That's why by sandwich theorem again, limit x times sine one over x as x goes to zero. By the way, you, you can put this uh, one-sided notations here, x is greater than zero. So zero, you are approaching from right. In this case, okay, zero is here and you are approaching from right. In this case, zero is here and you are approaching from left. That's why you can put here X approach from left notation. Okay, so the limit of this function from left is also zero, but one-sided limits are the same. That's why the overall limit of this function like that is zero by some theorem, of course. So you see, even if you don't know the graph, graphical behavior of it, it's okay, it is uh, much more easier to compute the limit to zero, but even if you don't know the graphical behavior of it, algebraically by using the sum theorem, you can easily compute that the limit is zero. Okay, second part of this lecture video is this fact. Limit of sine theta over theta as theta goes to zero is one. Why? Because we know the graph. From left, from right, look at the values of sine theta over theta. It is, this graph is the graph of this function. So you see that the limit of this function from both directions is one, so the limit is one. And the reverse, if you reverse the function as theta goes to zero, the limit is still zero, okay? You can also use the same fact by reversing the function. So let's try to apply this fact on computing limit questions. First example, so we want to compute limits with sine three, take three y over y as y goes to zero. Normally, if you insert y equals zero, sine zero is zero, four times zero is zero. So this is an indeterminate form in calculus. That's why we have to invent something to compute the limit. So this is 
what we will be using. This tool is a very nice, useful tool. So how to use it? You see, you have to have the same expression, the sine theta, theta, and uh, sorry, um, yes, let's continue. You, we have to have the same expression, but which is not the case here. I need to have three y. That's why, the second, that's why we have to multiply here by three over four. Okay, let's multiply both sides, numerator and denominator by the same value so that the question doesn't change. Limit y goes to zero, three over four sine three y divided by three over four times four y. Then you see we simplify these four coefficients so that, what did we do like this? You will see. So that you have now sine three y. Okay, this is a constant in front over three y. So that, that was the purpose. If you have the same angle theta theta, it, it doesn't matter if you have extra coefficients, 3y, 3y. The important fact is that if y goes to 0, 3y goes to 0 again. That's why you can apply your fact. So this part goes to 1 by this fact. And that's why the result is 3 over 4. And similarly for this limit question here, it is again 0 over 0 which is an indeterminate form. That's why we are using, trying to use some uh, tools. So limit t goes to zero, two t over sine t over cosine t, right? This is what it is. And then what we have, limit t goes to zero cosine t times two t sine t. And now, we are interested in this part. You see the reverse, uh, re reverse function is, ha has also the same property. That's why this part goes to one, so that you end up with limit t goes to zero, cos two times cosine t. Don't forget about that two coefficient here, right? So two times cosine t, this is two times cosine zero. Cosine zero is one, so the result of your limit is to. I stop here. This is the end of uh, this video. Thank you for listening.